the best games of the decade. Eh, it's not technically what this video is about. Everyone on the internet seems to be interested in giving us their take on the best games of the last decade. We recently crossed into 2020 and it makes sense to take the time to reflect on all the great titles that have come out in the past 10 years. I honestly can't pry my eyes away from the numerous amounts of videos, lists, and articles that keep popping up. A lot of the articles floating around the internet tend to be cop-outs though because they list off like a hundred or so games. Huh. Games Yard put Destiny at 16. Sick. 16? What the hell? The industry would never be the same again. It's been making me think about all the time I've wasted over the last decade. All the changes that came to the industry, the rise of microtransactions, indie games taking the world by storm, battle royales hitting the scene. This nonsense. And I really don't have to mention the advancement in tech. I mean, we went from this. And what shall we call him, my love? Ezio. Ezio Auditore da Firenze. <laughs> this. I don't know what to tell you. Things don't always work out. I've learned to try new kinds of games that I would have never touched before. Spooky games, thinking games, a Far Cry game. What, I don't like Far Cry, sue me. This all led to me taking a crack at a list of my own. Now you're all probably confused at the title of this video. There's two main reasons I wanted to do a top 5. First, I didn't want to spotlight games that were the absolute best, or that I thought were of the highest quality. I more wanted to take a look at games that left a strong impression on me and changed the way I thought about them moving forward. Second, I wanted to have some <coughs> variety by not only forcing myself to come up with a smaller selection, but I figured it would be fun to try and stick to one genre per game. So for example, I can't have two multiplayer shooters on the list, because I was definitely planning on having Battlefield 4 and 5 occupy two spots on the list. Which is why I'm making this a top 6 list, because there's one game I refuse to make this list without. Now before I go on, I have to preface this by saying that I by no means played every big release throughout the decade, so I'm probably going to be missing everyone's favorite title. Witcher 3. This is just my opinion, so don't get all worked up about the choices I made. Unless it's Destiny, you should feel bad for liking Destiny. Anywho, on to the list. This beautiful, dread-inducing game was a no-brainer. God damn it. What can I say about Dark Souls that hasn't already been beaten into the collective mind of the internet? It's basically been inducted into the video game Hall of Fame and for good reason. I initially saw nothing in this game, and I mean nothing. I thought it looked bland. I didn't understand why everyone was raving about another fantasy world full of swords and dragons, and I really didn't get why dying in one hit was deemed fun by so many people. I tried to pick this game up about five or six different times before it finally hit me, and man, it hit like a fucking freight train. See, I have this problem where if a game doesn't make a strong impression on me by the time the intro is done, I just give up on it and never touch it again. Or at least I used to before I played Dark Souls. I'm so glad I gave it a real shot though, because I would have been missing out on such a fascinating rich world, a fully realized world that few games since or before have been able to replicate. This isn't the most flashy or involved game out there, but this is a perfect example of a game that as a whole is greater than the sum of its parts. A combat is simple, but the difficulty is prevalent throughout and never lets up. It isn't the prettiest on a purely technical level, but the art style and design of every locale, enemy, weapon, and piece of armor all come together to showcase this dreary neverland that never fails to captivate me. The world of Lordran is just... Jesus Christ. Wandering through this haunting place is up there in terms of memorable game worlds. Yes, I even liked Blight Town. Like, a lot. Learning your way around Lordran and finding all the shortcuts and connecting routes really make this place feel alive. The enemy variety. Oh dear god, the enemy variety. This is one of my favorite aspects of any combat-oriented adventure, and man, this game really earned some bragging rights in this department especially when discussing the multitude of stress-inducing boss fights. The story isn't in your face, bogging down the flow with lengthy, unimportant cutscenes. It's a little more understated and allows you to find out on your own how exactly this world came to be. The second half of this game leaves a little to be desired, but Dark Souls doesn't hold your hand. It reinforces the fact that you shouldn't give up on a game too fast, because you never know what's going to be waiting on the other side. It is a through-and-through -through adventure. Resident Evil you ever just go into a title that you know little to nothing about in a genre that you're not familiar with, just curious about what could possibly be waiting for you beyond the title screen, and get hooked literally seconds into its opening? 
A few years back, I experienced this with Metal Gear Solid, which is now one of my favorite series of all time. And it's happening to me right now with Resident Evil. Now I have to mention that the RE2 remake was my introduction to this strange collection of games, so I'm speaking from the place of a newcomer. My friend got it for his birthday last year, and like an animal, I decided to unwrap it for him while he was away, play it on his PS4, and beat it before he even had the chance to get excited about it. I regret nothing, this game was well worth it. The horror genre was never really my thing until recently. Getting spooked for fun sounded awful to me, and the idea of stress being a core game mechanic in the form of limited ammo and ever impending doom seemed like something only a crazy person could love. But my recent dive into horror movies and a curiosity for what Resident Evil's been about all this time pushed me to slide the disc into the PS4, and I haven't looked back since. Everything in RE2 was designed to hook me in. The core gameplay loop being an inventory management, puzzle-based exploration adventure intertwined with tense moments of shit shit shit. Trying to balance the number of zombies in front of you with the number of bullets left in your magazine is something that will never get old. This game is a masterclass in building an atmosphere. The sound design is just intoxicating. I made sure to only play this game at night with all the lights off, sound cranked up to make sure I took in every footstep, undead moan, and moment of panic. The labyrinth-like design of the police station makes you feel isolated the deeper you delve into it eventually getting forced into some new location only to find your way back through some backtracking that never overstays its welcome. By the way, who the hell decided that a remake was just all of a sudden going to have the best lighting of any modern video game? I mean, the way your flashlight reacts to different situations is just bananas. This whole experience is just too much, man. Freaking item management, spooky ass police station, you gotta find the magic doubloons to open a hole in the room. There are chess pieces in the sewer. Man, this game has some freaky ass enemies waiting around every corner. Just when you start to get comfortable with the threats at hand, it always has something up its sleeve, just waiting to. Uh, oh god, oh, not now. If it's not evident at this point, I fell head over heels for this game, and now I can't stay away from Resident Evil. I'm excited to see where the series takes me, and I can't wait for what lies ahead in terms of my next horror game experience. This is one I would have sworn to anybody, like four years ago, would have never ended up on an anything list of mine. I never really branched out in terms of the kinds of games that I liked to play back in the day, and XCOM was a stepping stone for that no longer being the case. Because of this game, I ended up trying Fire Emblem, and I really had no interest in the FE series for the longest time. Have you guys played Blazing Sword? God, Blazing Sword is so good. Have you guys played Blazing Sword? The animations in this game are just freaking incredible. Just look at the- uh, I'm not emulating, you're emulating. Uh, look, over there, uh, Doom Eternal came out on time. I don't exactly remember what made me pick this one up. Steam had the version with all the DLC on sale for like three dimes and a paperclip, so I pulled the trigger. I really thought that I was getting ready for a fun little space-themed tactical RPG with neat cover mechanics and a fine story. What I didn't realize was that I was in for a deep and nail-biting game where every decision feels important, and not in a choose an interesting and thought-provoking dialogue option kind of way. I'm looking at you, Fallout 4. The game is split into two sections, the combat missions and the base management. While you're out on missions, you'll take command of a hand-picked crew with tasks with objectives ranging from killing all the targets at hand, civilian search and rescue, or collecting data from a wrecked spacecraft. Customizing your crew in XCOM is gambling levels of addicting. You get to name them, choose what they look like, and choose what gear and weapons they take onto the field. After your new recruits level up for the first time, they get a randomly assigned class to their name, and from there, you are in charge of selecting their skills. Growing your unit is completely up to you, and watching the rookies take rank in your squad is nothing short of satisfying. The best part of it all is that the game is permadeath, so saving your units on the battlefield becomes its own metagame during the missions. You even get this little funeral room with all your fallen soldiers listed. Fucking bagpipes, man. Tears every time. The rest of the game consists of a really involved micromanagement style game with multiple systems. You have to balance a monthly budget to research and develop new gear and defense weapons for your crew to protect the world from alien threats. Gotta keep the world's nations at ease by supplying them with protection and building up your base to support all kinds of new ventures. Every decision you make on and off the battlefield affects your unit's progression, your ability to keep the world's countries on your side, and the alien threat at bay, preventing further disaster. I would start playing XCOM at 4 or 5 p.m., then look up to see that an easy four hours had passed since I'd last gotten up from my chair. This game really showed me that I could go outside my comfort zone and find something super engrossing the way I would any other classic game I've grown accustomed to. If there's gonna be a shooter on this list, it has to be Reach. A testament to Bungie's ability on delivering a quality product. 
This game holds a very special place in my heart. This was my introduction to Halo, the Xbox 360, and the world of online gaming. Oh my god, shut up! Freaking burning money! Ah, <sighs> the good old days. Before this game, I was purely a Nintendo kid. I never knew what a Master Chief was until I was like 10, and the idea of playing one of those violent shooting games was still a thought process I had to come to terms with as I unboxed my 360. I didn't know that what awaited would quickly turn into what is effectively my gold standard for multiplayer shooters. This game is so rich with content, it's insane. I guess we gotta start with the campaign. Unlike the classic trilogy's Lone Wolf Save the Galaxy narrative, this Halo decides to tell a smaller scale story about Alpha Na uh... <laughs> Noble Team. <clears throat> the group responsible for delivering Cortana, or a segment of her AI, to the Pillar of Autumn before it leaves the planet. Huh. This reminds me of something. The story itself isn't anything outstanding, but the levels are really fun and offer a couple of fun set pieces. It's especially fun to run through with some friends, which is kind of a main theme for this game. Bringing people together has basically been a mainstay for the Halo series. This just happens to be the particular Halo that I got attached to. Every mode this game offers either encourages you to play with someone, or the experience is greatly improved when you do. Campaign? Hop on with some friends, set that sucker to legendary, and have at it. Matchmaking? Grab a squad together and show everyone just how bad you and your friends are at the game. Forge? See you in three hours. Custom games? Make that four. Custom games on its own hold so many good memories for me. My buddies and I would just comb through file shares looking for any interesting mode we could get our hands on. Predator Hunter game types with this weird dark mode filter that would turn the session into a horror game. Obstacle courses completely devoid of any combat. The overwhelming number of vehicle game types, variations on Rocket Hog, Sumo Wrestling, and Speed Halo. This mode will go down in Halo history. A lobby any bigger than four people and the chat would just be filled with laughter and incomprehensible hollering. That's what I remember the most from Halo Reach. The sheer number of hours I spent in an Xbox Live party with my friends goofing off and killing each other with crazy weapons, rule sets, and game types, just having a fucking blast. This game set the bar for what I look for in a multiplayer experience for years to come. Even though I have my problems with 343's acquisition of Halo, they still seem to take all the aspects of the multiplayer seriously, competitive or not. It makes me happy to see games like Overwatch take the time to offer custom community-made content as a feature because making your own fun with a group of friends can be just as amazing as a well-designed game on its own right. Before I talk about this next entry, I have to mention the journey that indie games have been on in the past 10 years. Now when you talk about indie games, there are just way too many titles to choose from. You obviously can't exclude Minecraft from the conversation. It was there during the rise of Let's Plays and it's still played to this day. Cuphead exploded onto the scene with endless praise for delivering on almost all of its promises, even after such a long wait. Plenty of indie games went viral, if you will, taking over YouTube for weeks at a time and creating communities around the games that propped them up to something bigger than the games themselves. <laughs> One thing I love about indie games has to be the sheer diversity in what you can get. It's kind of awe-inspiring what these small studios can do with the vision that they truly believe in. That's why Hyperlight Drifter is my indie game of choice. Have you ever watched the opening cutscene for this game? It's enthralling. This game is basically the violent synth version of Zelda you never knew you wanted, and I don't mean that as a knock to its quality in the slightest. Hyperlight Drifter kind of just starts and it instantly pulls you in. The titular Drifter clearly has some leaky chest situation going on, and it's not super clear what the deal is in this world until you take control. Hyperlight really doesn't bother telling you a story in a traditional sense. It offers you bits and pieces of the world through these really pretty comic type panels when you talk to NPCs, and occasionally the game will have something important happen right during the gameplay, and that's about it. The main focus of the game is the drifter and the struggles he goes through the longer he goes on this quest. Every time I came across someone's story or wandered across a new vista, I couldn't help but stop what I was doing and just take it in. This world feels so alive. As much as a hopeless post-apocalyptic landscape can feel alive anyway. <laughs> Every character design is dripping with personality. Every corner of the map has its own identity. The four sections of the world leading up to the dungeons are all incredibly distinct, making each individual trek a new adventure. I have no idea what it takes to create pixel art this good, but damn, the dev team deserves some recognition. I was constantly searching every nook and cranny of this world, and there are a ton of neat little visual cues that will stand out to keen observers begging to be explored. My ass was glued to the couch for a week straight playing this game because I didn't want to leave this beautiful place. There was just something so new about the way this game presented itself that left a strong impact on me. I haven't even talked about the gameplay that much, which is so fluid and amazing by the way. The main dodge drift mechanic is so satisfying to combine with the fighting, but Hyperlight Drifter really just made me feel like I was somewhere else. I have to commend Heart Machine and everything they did with this game. It's a true escape.
Is this list technically a cop-out by having Zelda on it? Nah, I don't care. Okay, here it is, the game I could not for the life of me make this video without at least touching on. Breath of the Wild. Man, you guys are making me play this game again. I got other shit to play. I mean, look at this, half of the script is Breath of the Wild. I have nothing new or eye-opening to say about this game, but I have to sing its praises because this game made me feel like a kid again. It's not perfect and it has plenty of flaws, but I really don't care because this game is pretty much the closest I have ever gotten to feel like I'm on a genuine freaking adventure in a video game, period. If you guys haven't noticed by now, I kinda like open exploration games with really cool worlds. And by kinda, I mean really, really love. I honestly think that I played Breath of the Wild at the perfect time. I haven't enjoyed the Zelda series for all that long, if I'm being honest. Started with Ocarina of Time, then went on to Link Between Worlds a few years after it came out. Played the hell out of Wind Waker, loved the Majora's Mask to death, and then I tried Breath of the Wild the day I got my Switch. I then proceeded to pump over 150 hours into this lovely cartridge for an entire summer. The exploration is just so organic. This game is the very definition of, you see that in the distance? You can go there. The way I describe this game to someone looking to play it is by telling them they can just pick a random direction, go in said direction, and then get sucked into this random and unique journey for the next 3-4 to four hours of their life. Completely disconnected from the main quest. The world is filled with secrets, magic islands, wintry peaks, giant lakes, and pretty much any kind of landscape you can think of. You never know what you'll encounter until you get there. Picking a distant mountain, making it to the top, just barely clearing the edge with the perfect amount of stamina and bearing witness to the breathtaking view is an experience this game offers in spades. And don't get me started on jumping off and paragliding to whatever shiny new spot on the map catches your interest. The way you interact with the world and in turn, all the ways that the world can interact with you, is just beautiful. There are some really interesting and unique systems at play that allow you to do really anything you can think of to solve the challenges you face. Anytime I turned Breath of the Wild on, I just got sucked into this beautiful, mesmerizing world, and I think it'll be a long time before I forget the awesome memories I made playing it. It reminded me why I play video games. Definitely the best reason to travel an hour and a half during a thunderstorm just to buy a Switch because they were all sold out in your town. Like I said before, these weren't my absolute favorite games of the last 10 years, but they are all really important to me for one reason or the other. Believe me, there are some games I didn't mention that could have me going on for hours. I think it's really awesome that people are taking the time to look back at the titles that left an impact on them. Not all of my choices were the most conventional, but these games were kind of integral in terms of what I looked for after experiencing them. They've all led me to new series I would have never found on my own. I wonder what the next decade has in store for us. Huh, Final Fantasy VII Remake's finally coming out. Yep, hell froze over. It was nice talking to you all.